Okay, so good morning to all of you. And the subtopic, which I call it subtopic because it's a part of this, this big bunch. It's quite a big topic, this valuation of real assets and corporate tax. So the, the subtopic that we shall discuss today is that actually this, this topic is based on a narrative. It's like a philosophy. It's based on a way of thinking. And before I touch upon this topic, I want to discuss that what that philosophy, what that background is. I think in the management accounting course, or maybe in some other courses, I discussed with you that the value of the a firm, if you want to give a definition of a firm, it has three components. The one component is financing, where money comes from. We also call it capital structure. And this is on the liability side of the balance sheet. Why it's a liability side on the balance sheet? Because it shows money comes from, and money come from the debt holders and the equity holders. And basically, both are. Uh, the firm's liabilities in a way. Um, debt holder is sort of external liability. You have to give them fixed rate of interest. And at the same time, you have to agree with them that you will be giving the principal amount back to them in time. So there's no possibility of any, you know, uh, there's no possibility that you can say that, hey, I'm sorry, I can't pay you debt. Uh, equity is a little bit different because here, uh, there's no such promise that you will pay them certain uh, rate of return. Well, of course, you should give it or you must give it, but there's no such legal promise that if a firm having a loss, you will share nothing with your shareholders. Uh, not even that you have to give the money back to them, the principal amount. You don't have to give it back. So that makes the equity a riskier proposition in comparison to the debt. But that's not the main point of discussion today. The main point of discussion today is that the company has, a firm has three triad, it's like a three, three, uh, like a tripod, like a three-legged thing. Uh, the first thing, the first leg is financing. I repeat, financing where money comes from. It's also, it's also known as capital structure. And this is on the liability side of the balance sheet. And then we have the other side of the balance sheet called assets. That is investing. We invest, hence we purchase, we buy, we start, we, we build up assets. And investing is where money goes to. So there is a balance. There is a, on the one side of the equation is the money comes from, the second side is money goes to, and what makes the third component, what difference it makes, uh, uh, the third component makes is that operations. And if you, if you have, if you remember this word operation, you can relate it with the income statement because over there we see the word, we hear it, we re read it, operating profit. From assets, we earn. For financing, from investing, we earn. For the financing, we pay. It means that the rate of return on investment must be more than the cost of capital you pay. So if your total cost of capital debt and equity is 5%, your rate of return from your assets should be more than 5%. And what makes it possible? Who makes it possible? This is the operation side of the company. If company is selling more, um, the revenue is increasing, the cost is curtailed, uh, the fixed cost is reducing, the tax is low, your finance cost is less, what, whatever you see in the income statement, then you would see that the company has more net profit. This net profit 
you share with your shareholders and you also reinvest in your capital back in the company. So this is the mechanism of three things, three components, the company's financing, investing, and in between comes operation. The reason I'm giving this example is that there is a traditional way of thinking. Traditional way of thinking is that the company's value, if you want to see the value drivers, that who generate value to, for the company, the traditional school of thought is that financing never adds value to the company. It's investing which creates value. It's very important to note down that the traditional way of thinking is that financing is only, you just arrange money, that's it. Now, how to use that money, how to invest in the assets, uh, which assets to buy, which not to buy, that's the main job. The company is successful or a failed company depending upon their investment strategy, not the financing money. Money can come from any side. Your company can be 100% financed by equity with no debt. We call it unlevered company. Hope you remember uh, unlevered beta and levered beta. You can have zero debt and 100% equity. Or on the other extreme, you can have 75% of debt or 25% of equity. It makes no sense. I don't say it. Who says it? People who believe in the classical way of thinking. I'll come back more in details later. But those people who are very classicals, very old economists, very traditional way of thinking, they believe that financing has no role to play in the value creation of the company. These are the assets which are the real value drivers. They are the movers and shakers of the company. They make value to the company, not the financing. So it's uh, investing makes sense. The second way of thinking, the second, uh, you know, the line of thinking, uh, which I have discussed with you, I'm very sure, that debt is cheaper than equity. The reason is that, the reason is that, uh, but first, first, let me give you an example. I, I, I want to go to this debt is cheaper, blah, 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 later on, but I want to give you an example first. My first statement, which I just finished, is that traditional way of thinking is that it's not the financing which adds value to the company. It's the investing. Let me give you an example. Um, New share. I have the financial statements of a very famous company, one of the biggest companies in the world, British Petroleum, BP. BP is listed, I believe, in uh, in London's stock exchange for sure, but it's also listed in New York Stock Exchange. And that's where the data, even though it's a British company, the data is here shown in dollar million. So, yeah. So basically, you can see that the company's total liabilities are this much. And the total equity is this much. Traditional school of thought says that the total of debt and the total of equity, I repeat, total of debt and total of equity, these are the financing side. And they play no role, no role at all to create value to the company. The only thing which creates value are this the total assets, the investing side. This is the investing side. This is the total of investing side. So, you know the equation of uh, um, balance sheet, the total assets are equal to total debt, or the, oh, sorry, liabilities, total liabilities plus total equity. So even though these both sides are 295, 194, and when I add, uh, sorry, when I add total liabilities and 
total equity, 194486, and total equity is this much, it comes to be same, 295194. You can check it, 295194. So if I add in total liabilities, uh, the total equity, it will also, so this plus this would be equal to this. So even though mathematically this is same, but practically they are not same because this side, the bottom side, the liability side is representing the company's financing, whereas the above the top side, the total assets makes the investing side. And the old orthodox traditional way of thinking is that financing, uh, so basically what they're trying to say that, hey, uh, this number could be more, this could be less, or this could be more, or this could be less. So it, it makes no difference. It makes no difference because they will not make any change in the value. The value would be changed by this number. Okay, so this is a very big uh, line of thinking that the company's value is created not by the financing side, but, but by the investing side. So financing could be anything you can be a company which is 100% financed by equity, or you could be a company which is 50-50 uh, financed by debt and equity, it makes no difference. All right. And then the next line is, uh, am I sharing it for you? Yeah, okay. The next line is that debt invest, the, the debt interest payments are tax deductible. Or we can say that debt is cheaper. And this gets proved when I share the same income statement, the same financial statement with you. Uh, I have to go back a little bit up to the income statement. And there we are. So you can see that. Uh, there are two kind of when you when you finance your company, you take money from your debt holders, you take money from your equity holders. To the to the debt holders, you pay interest. And interest in the finance cost, interest is a very main is a main component of your finance cost. So your finance cost primarily comprise of your uh, interest. And you can see that the company has been, uh, in 2019, this was the interest rate. So it's about $3.5 billion they paid in the interest rate. And if you compare it to the last years, you can see that there is a consistently uh, a spurt, a rise in the company's interest payments. There could be two reasons. Uh, either the interest rate has increased with the same amount of debt or it could be possible that the company is borrowing more amount. The latter, the second statement to me seems more reasonable that maybe over the time, the company's total debt or liabilities have been increasing and the payment is increasing. Look at this, 3.5 billion is a whopping amount in terms, but it's a big company, of course. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that this money is a, is a cash flow is the cash stream going to the debt holders. Debt holders are one of your financiers, okay? And then comes the taxation, okay? I think I said a couple of times before that the finance costs are tax-free because they are paid before tax is paid. But then this money belongs to attributable. It's not, it doesn't say that the money is divided uh, between shareholders. It says the money belongs to the shareholders. But this, if you see, this money which belongs to shareholders come after you pay tax. It means that who has borne, who has tolerated the burden of three point, um, about four billion of, uh, you know, uh, dollars of tax? Who bears this burden? Debt holders, no. They are playing safe. They just, they didn't pay any tax. This money has been deducted from the share of the shareholders. 
the profit share of the shareholders. So imagine a situation, if there were no taxation, then not 4190, but 8154 would have been in the pockets of shareholders. It means that the tax burden, the hammer of tax falls on the shareholders. And I think I discussed with you that the shareholders are of two types. Uh, the main category of shareholder is uh, the ordinary shareholders, the equity shareholders, the common shareholders. Uh, and the second category is the non-controlling interest shareholders. This non-controlling category is always very small, just a small fraction of the total shareholders. The ordinary shareholders have the voting rights. If you have 10 shares, you have 10 votes. Uh, these shareholders, the non-controlling shareholders, they surrender, they give up their voting right. Uh, but in turn, they get some extra share in the profits. So basically, they say that, hey, you give us some more profit. Uh, we don't want the votes. Okay. And the word controlling comes because those shareholders who have the right to vote, they can control the company through their voting. You can vote in favor or against of emotion. Uh, so it means that the ordinary, the common shareholders have a uh, control. They can control the company through the voting system. But these people, since they don't have votes, they can't control. But the only thing in turn they get, in, uh, which goes in their favor is that uh, they can. Uh, they would be first in the queue when the company is giving the, distributing the profit. And secondly, they would get some extra profit from the company. Uh, to, 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 to compensate their sacrifice of giving up of their voting rights. So the, the purpose again is not to discuss these technicalities, but to make a statement that the safe income stream goes to debt holders. Safe means the debt, the tax-free, uh, the tax-free stream, whereas the risky uh, stream uh, which is after tax. Look, in a way, uh, the shareholders are treated a little bit badly when I see this portion. How? The obvious reason is that tax doesn't fall on debt holders' income, but tax falls on the shareholders' income. And secondly, the finance cost is a safe income. Why safe income? Because when you are a debt holder, you know that you will get the fixed rate of interest. And you also know that after some time, after a certain time period, you would get your money back. So you are, you rest assured, you are fully guaranteed that the money which you invested in the company would come back to you in the form of debt. And not only it come back, but it will also earn some interest. But look at these poor chaps the shareholders. They don't even know if they would get any share in the profit because if the company's profit is 8154 and the company's tax is 10,000, then this figure would be a loss. And if it is a loss, then it, nothing belongs to shareholders. Then the shareholders would lose the value because their capital would shrink. And secondly, they are bearing the burden of tax entirely. All the corporate tax is falling on the shoulder of the shareholders. So in a way, when I see this uh, taxation system that we have currently, uh, it seems that uh, there is a less, there's no burden of the corporate tax on the safe income stream, but the riskier income stream is bearing almost all the burden, which makes the share, the equity investment even riskier. Okay. So this is the little bit of background. Uh, the, the two classic points, which you must remember, uh, that when I showed you the balance sheet, the traditional way of thinking is that these are the value drivers of the company. They increase the value or decrease the value because if you don't invest in good assets, the value will go down. 
whereas the total equity plus the total liabilities, these are just financing. They're only making arrangement of funds for the company to invest. So this plus this makes no difference on the company value. And all the value is uh, created or destroyed by the investing side. Number one statement. Number two statement. A big statement rather that uh, the debt is cheaper because it's tax-free. Equity is expensive because you get the share or the cash flow which goes to the uh, equity holder, equi the shareholders after you pay tax. And slightly, uh, I would say, if, if I modify the second statement, I would say that uh, that the one, the, the, the safer income stream are cheaper because no tax burden, whereas the riskier income stream are uh, are bearing are, are expensive because here um, they are calculated after tax is paid. So that makes apparently uh, the position of the shareholders in the company uh, a little bit tricky. Okay, so I want you to think about it a little bit more. And yeah, so one, one quick thing I want to discuss with you that when I see uh, the financing, this is 2019 and this is 2018. In 2018, your total liabilities were one, one, two, three, nine, one. And when I divide this figure by total equity, uh, if I divide this figure by total equity, and the total equity is 100708708, the ratio comes to be 1.11. I, I can write it down so that I don't, or maybe I can call it 1.12. This 1.12 means that for every one dollar of equity, there is a one point one two dollar of liabilities or debt. Okay, now I calculate for two thousand nineteen. For two thousand nineteen, the total liabilities are one two zero eight nine one. And when I divide, no, I'm sorry, I have to, I made a mistake. So the total liabilities are actually 194, uh, 486. Okay. 194, 486. And when I divide this uh, figure by the total equity, which is 100, 708, 100, 708 it comes to be 1.93. It means that for every one dollar of equity, there's a 1.93 dollar of debt. And last time the, for the 2018, it was 1.12. So if I divide, if I subtract one point from 1.93, if I subtract 1.12, there is, 0 0.81. So for every one euro of equity, there is an additional debt of 0 0.81. And this is exactly the reason why you see that the interest payment is so big uh, in 2019. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this will make no difference. Who says it? I mean, 1.93 and 1.12, they are massively different from one, each, from one uh, another. But the traditional school of thinking is that it could be 1.93, it can be 2 point whatever, 3.5 point, it makes no difference. The only difference is made by total assets. That's a, that's a very big statement. And the second thing, 
uh, what they say is that debt is cheaper than the equity because tax man uh, for tax man doesn't put any tax on the on the interest cost, uh, whereas all the tax falls loose on the, the the profit which belongs to the shareholders. That is a key argument. These two statements are very important to understand um, if you want to understand this topic, which we shall follow on. And, and also the nature of uh, cash flows are very important to understand. The finance cost is for the debt payments. Uh, this is considered safer because debt is not only cheaper, but safe. Because you get fixed interest and the money comes back to you. Whereas the, the money that belongs to the shareholders is riskier. This cash flow is riskier because the shareholders there's no guarantee that they would earn anything. It could be a loss, nothing much they can do. And secondly, they may lose even their original investment in the company. So these are a couple of things which you must, I know you know, know these things, but it's important that you understand them more cohesively in a more organized manner uh, so that we can understand the whole discussion to follow on. Okay, so it's apparently uh, based on our discussion, it seems that the debt is cheaper, debt is preferred, debt is good, but that's not, that's not always the case. Debt has a side effect. The side effect is point number two, distress cost, or what I call as financial distress cost. Distress cost of that when the company is borrowing because look, it seems apparently that debt is very cheaper because there's no tax burden and everything is fine. So if a company keeps borrowing, borrowing, borrowing and borrowing, eventually there'll be more strain, more stress on the company's cash outflows. Because unlike shareholders who you don't have to give basically anything, to the debt holders, you have to give a lot of things. You have to give them fixed interest you also have to give them the, 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 the installment, the full debt at the end of the period, okay? So there's a more stress on the cash flows, cash outflows of, of the company. And moreover, when a company has more debt, imagine you are a company and you want me to invest in your equity. You say, Shab, can you invest in our equity shares? And I say, all right, let me consider, let me see your financial performance. And I find that your debt has increased tremendously. Like, like we just noticed in the case of BP, it went, the ratio of debt to equity used to be 1.12 in 2018. In 2019, it went up to 1.93. In this situation, if you are BP and you ask me to invest in your company in the equity, I would be threatened. I would be scared of investing equity in equity in your company. Because I would know that in the event of company crisis, we have a theory called packing order hypothesis. Pack. Pack means like, have you seen the woodpecker? Is packing the wood? So eating away. So who would pack the company first? It would be employees, it would be the government, it would be anybody and everybody. But one thing is for sure that in all the countries, the last person who have this packing order are the shareholders. So your debt was 1.12, now it went up to 1.93. I would ask myself, hey, what happened if the company is in a crisis? or it becomes bankrupt from 1.12 to 1.93. So all the money basically first will go to the debt holders and whatever is left out, left over, if it is, that I would get. So in such situation, I find that my stakes are threatened. My rights are threatened. Now I have two ways, either I refuse the company that, hey, I'm not going to invest in your company's equity. I don't want to become your shareholders. I'm not going to invest it. Or second point is that I can ask for the huge risk premium. Risk premium means the extra compensation for the risk which company would give me so that I can invest in the equity. It means that 
if you are saving money from debt, you are giving more money to your equity holders so that they can remain in the company. So it's like, um, you know, one step forward, two step backwards. It means that you are saving money from the, from the debt because the interest is cheaper. You pay it before you pay tax. But on the other hand, your equity investment, your cost of equity will go up hugely. And on top of that, there would be a pressure strain on the cash outflows. And it could be possible that when you're working under pressure, the company can make some silly mistakes. The company can choose wrong projects uh, and the company can collapse. There could be, you, you can be in the crisis, but you still have to pay uh, your debt holder. So you may, be, you may have to borrow more to pay your old debts and the interest. And one more thing I have noticed about, which is a bad thing about debt, is that debt makes you short termist. Debt makes you not having a long time horizon uh, of the company, but debt makes you like living on daily basis. What's the word in English? Uh, debt makes you myopic, short sighted. Why? Because when you borrow, you are always looking for some cash flows so that you reserve that money to pay to your debt holders. Therefore, you are in a rush. You means the CEO and the CFO of the company, uh, the top managers. You are in a rush to generate cash flows as soon as possible. So what you do, you choose those projects which can generate cash flow as fast as possible, even though they're not very good projects for the company. But those projects which are for the long term, uh, the, you know, benefit of the company, but you have to show some patience uh, before you get any cash flows. You don't invest in that. Because then you have to, you would be in a pressure uh, to, to generate cash flows to give your, to your debt holders. Okay, so this is some kind of dilemma which the CFO and the CEO, CEO of the company would, would be encountering that should they invest in the quick bucks making short-term investments, which would give them cash flow faster, but they may not be good for the financial sustainability of the company? Or should you wait for some time and you should invest in those projects which will not generate cash flow immediately? Uh, you have to wait for a certain time, but those projects are really, really um, you know, uh, useful, they're imperative for the company. So that for the, between the long-term horizon, long-term way of thinking and the short-term way of thinking, the CFO would prefer short-term way of thinking because he is in a rush to not to disappoint the debt holders. Okay, so the company's investing can be bad. And actually, it can be a very good thesis topic that how efficiently the companies invest, those who are in debt, does debt have an impact on the quality of investing? Is it so that the companies whose D to E ratio is more, they invest in short-term assets? And the company whose D to E ratio is low, they invest in the long-term assets. Because those companies where equity is more and debt is less, there's no immediate performance pressure because you don't have to, you're not bound to give anything to the shareholders. Or maybe the shareholders have invested in your company because they, you have the long time horizon, like a growth company. The growth company, you have to wait for decades before you get any dividend from the company. I mean, I, I give the example of Microsoft. The Microsoft investors, when Microsoft was a typical growth company in, uh, uh, in, in the, in the late 90s and early 2000, uh, for 15 years, not a, sing, uh, the, the, not a single cent of dividend was given to the shareholders of Microsoft because the shareholders of Microsoft were prepared to wait. They knew the future of the company. They were very confident that, hey, we don't want any dividend. That's, that's the company, you generate profits and keep recycling, keep reinvesting in the company so that it, it, the stock price really goes up. But if they were debt holders, they would not have waited for 
15 years. And in that case, Microsoft would have taken some bad decisions. And no wonder uh, Microsoft's debt was zero uh, during that time because they didn't want to take a chance because debt holders are impatient. And because they are impatient, they press the panic button and hence it has the effect on the CEO and CFO to, to invest in the short-term projects. And remember, the companies never survive based on the short-term projects. Well, of course, you can take short-term projects, but the real USP, if a company has to sustain, succeed in the long-term of the long-term projects, those projects which will generate value after many years, but once they generate the value, that would sustain for many, many, many years to come. So there is a huge, uh, there's a good reasoning why uh, as a uh, as a um, as a risk averse investor i would be very hesitant to invest in a company which is neck deep in debt okay so these are different arguments which you should consider um, so therefore uh, we have some advantages associated with the debt and we also have some disadvantages associated with it uh, every company looks for uh, an ideal, uh, judicious mix of debt and equity. Um, in fact, I would like to share with you that, or maybe I shared with you, uh, that some two years ago, uh, We had an IB thesis of a student and that student actually wrote something similar um, which I'm discussing with you. I didn't share it with you yet, but I can do it right now. Research articles. Um, copy the link. Yeah, I was sharing this article with this corporate finance students yesterday. Ah, yeah, capital structure article and copy. Yeah. Oh, yes. So if I can share the screen with you. Yeah. So, and then we made this article that how the financial crisis have an impact on the capital structure. Capital structure means what, what fraction of debt and what fraction of equity we have, okay? And this is my student who wrote thesis on uh, this topic and then we published it. Uh, this is one of the best in the, in, in the field of finance, this journal. So, and, Anyway, so this article is, is here uh, in just in case you, uh, you're interested and we are discussing about that what factors make uh, debt or equity attractive in the Nordic countries. All the data was from the Nordic countries. So we took uh, Finland, of course, Sweden, Norway, uh, Denmark. So four countries we studied in this research. Uh, yeah, coming back to the slides. All right. So the firms um, save for cash flow stream, as I discussed with you, goes to the, the debt and the riskier uh, finance, uh, the cash flow or the cash stream goes to the equity holders who discussed it. Uh, after this background, it took us a lot of time to understand the background, but if the background is strong, then it's easy to, to, to learn more concepts. Um, in this context, I would like to give you, to introduce you to a theory. This is one of the Modigliani and Miller's first proposition. This theory or this proposition is one of the classics in the field of finance, a very traditional way of thinking. Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller, they won Nobel Prize in economics. If you don't 
if you know or if you don't know i can i can repeat that finance is 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 also a part of economics basically so so there are many finance people who have got a uh, nobel prize in economics basically and i think uh, it's during 1970s when franco modigliani and morton miller uh, they won nobel prize in economics but i would say that these are very controversial uh, economists uh, people love to hate them or hate to love them it's a very love hate relationship with them because they have given very controversial kind of uh, theories or concepts um if i have to say if i have to sum up what modigliani and miller have said they say exactly what i said before that the value of the firm is determined by its real assets and not the securities securities are like debt holders and the equity holders the, they say that the liability side of the company is just a piece of paper because they are claims the real show is is on the investing side when you buy land you build up some uh, construction site you have the buildings you have like for example bp you have the oil rigs you have the haulage you have the fields where you are uh, are expecting that there would be oil underneath you have the buildings you have all the tangible assets all the fixed assets most of them are the fixed assets so that's where the real show begins and they give an example rather i uh, kind of cooked up an example that financing is like a wrapping paper and investing is the gift inside the wrapping paper and i don't have to say who is more important the wrapping paper the box or the actual gift so modigliani and miller they say that financing is only some kind of facilitator presentable it makes the gift presentable otherwise the real gift which matters to the person who receives it is not the wrapping paper it is the gift the actual gift inside the box so much importance modigliani and miller have given to this uh, investing side they don't give any credit any uh, you know so for example in case of bp we saw the debt to equity ratio was 1.12 in 2018 in 2019 it, it went up drastically 1.93 it's a big 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 change in the company's capital structure but modigliani and miller will not even notice it at all for them it doesn't matter where money comes from what matters is where money goes to that is investing okay uh, and to prove their point uh, they give a hypothesis they give an example they say that in perfect financial markets uh, when i say perfect financial markets it means that it's they are talking about not the real world scenario but some kind of utopian world uh, where everything is perfect uh, when i say perfect it means the large number of investors there are large number of companies where those investors can invest in there's no restriction on borrowing uh, there's no taxation regime there's no man made restrictions you can invest and borrow wherever you want so these are very kind of uh, fanciful uh, highly you know kind of uh, fantasy type of uh, uh, assumptions in the perfect financial markets and you see that in the real life we don't have the perfect life uh but anyways when you make a theory you think about a very perfect uh scenario so that you can you don't get mentally crippled by the the harshness of the realities um modigliani and miller to put up their example to put up their arguments they give an example and the example is that imagine there's a company firm 1 the firm one has all equity and no debt hence 
this company can be called unlevered company. Remember, we had discussion about levered and unlevered beta and cost of equity uh, last week. The company with no debt is called unlevered company. The total value of the company is equal to the total value of equity because uh, on the asset side, it's value of unlevered company. You can see U in the, in the subscript. V, value of the company. U, U means unlevered. So basically, value of the unlevered company is same as the value of the equity of the unlevered company. So this is the total of assets, VU, and this is the total of liabilities, EU, the value of equity. Now imagine, you are an investor, and you have bought 1% of the company's stock. Since there is no difference between EU and VU, because the only value, value of the unlevered company is the total assets. Total assets are equal to total equity because there are no liabilities, there's no debt. So EU and VU are same. So if you have invested 1% of the companies in companies stock, you are basically owning 1% of the value of the company. So you are the owner of the company by 1%. Because you own 1%, you are also entitled to 1% share of the profits of the company. So you can see that you are owning, this is your ownership in the company, and this is your claim in the profits. Now remember this thing, that when you are an investor in the unlevered company, you have 1% share, 1% share in the ownership, and you also claim 1% of the total profits. Remember this equation. Situation two. Now, this time, you are investing 1% in the company, but this company is levered. Company. Levered means the company has debt. Of course, it has equity, but it has debt also. So the value of the equity of the levered company's EL, now this time the, the subscript is not, the bottom letter is not U but L, L means levered. So you have invested in 1% of the equity and 1% of the debt, okay? And the equity of levered company is equal to the value of the company minus the liability of the debt. So it's quite simple that equity, uh, because we know that assets are equal to liabilities plus equity, and equity is equal to value minus liabilities. So, because you have invested 1% in debt, you own 1% of the debt of the levered company, and you also own 1% of the uh, equity. Okay? Uh, and when you add it, it becomes this, if you solve this mathematical equation, uh, 0 0.01 is common, DL plus EL, and debt plus equity is value of the company. Debt plus equity is assets. So since you own 1% of debt and equity, hence you own 1% of total value of the company. Now, on the other side, what you get from the company? You get 1% of the interest, and then you also get 1% of the residual claim. Residual claim is that what is left over? What is left over? So you pay interest and then profits. From profits, you minus interest and you get 1% of it. So the equity holder will get whatever profit is left after paying the debt holders. So that's why I write here profits minus interest. And when you add it up, you have the interest with the minus sign and you have the interest with the positive sign, so that gets canceled, so you get 1% of the profits. So you have 1% ownership in the company and you own, you claim 1% of the profits. And this is exactly same as, uh, this is exactly same as what we saw in the previous slide, that when the company was levered, you own 1% of the company and you 
you claim 1% of the profits. And even if the company is levered, you still own 1% of the company and you claim 1% of the profits. It means that unlevered or levered, it doesn't change the position of the investor. Hence, debt or no debt makes no difference. This is the claim. This is the proposition one of the, of the Modigliani and Miller. Now, I want you to observe something. When you see this calculation, 1% of interest, and then 1% of the remaining profit after paying interest, you see that something is missing in this, this, in this calculation. Is any item missing? When you see your income statement, and when you compare what Modigliani and Miller are saying, do you see that something is missing in this discussion on the right-hand side portion, which I have highlighted? Okay, remember it. 1% finance cost and 1% the remaining profits after paying interest. And compare this with, compare this with the, the income, uh, sorry, compare it with, where is the, where is it? Where is the BP? Ah, it's here. And compare it with BP's income statement. Yeah, isn't that missing tax? Exactly. Tax. exactly, exactly, exactly. Well spotted, Santu. Here, tax is a very prominent thing, but when you see um, what Modigliani and Miller are talking about, they don't talk about, from them, after finance cost, you straight away go to the profit after tax, the profit which belongs to the shareholders. And they totally bypass, they totally bypass what Santu spotted taxation. They have totally forgotten it, not forgotten it, they have totally ignored it. And they have a reason to ignore it. The reason to ignore it is that because they have given a disclaimer in the very beginning, in perfect financial markets, in perfect financial markets, uh, there is no man-made restriction. And tax is a man-made restriction. Tax is made by man, the government, basically. So that's very important. The taxation is kind of restriction in the free flow. Taxation is, some, is like a blockade, which makes one form better than the other. So it's an inorganic. Taxation is an inorganic development block in the financial world, in the perfect financial world, uh, people should have choice to invest in debt, equity, this company, that company, in the country, abroad, whatever they want without any restriction. But remember, the perfect world, the perfect financial market, or anything which is uh, starting with the word perfect is only a utopia. The realities are full of technical and the other, you know, hindrances. Uh, but if you talk about the word perfect, we talk only about something which is very utopian, something very idealistic. So they are very clever people going by their assumptions of financial perfection. They have totally bypassed. So if we are living in a taxless world, then what Modigliani and Miller have said is true. But when we see the realities of life, which I want to show first here, I have I've just jumped a few slides, but I'll go back to them. But I want to, I'm, I'm itching, my hands are itching to, to, to prove Modigliani and Miller wrong. I want to prove them wrong right now before we go further to any discussion. In this slide, we would prove Modigliani and Miller wrong. And look, 
we have three columns here. The first company is U and the second company is L. U means unlevered. L means levered. Unlevered means no debt. Levered means with debt. And the starting point of comparison is EBIT is called your heading profit. Operating prof from assets from assets because if you see the formula of operating profit it is the total revenue minus cost of goods sold which are your main operating cost and I deliberately keep them same number thousand thousand that all the profits which is generated by the asset side is same so that our comparison is is we are comparing apples with apples, basically. So we are having the same number. So that both companies, operationally, they are equally successful, thousand, thousand. Whatever profit they extract from the assets is same. It means that from the asset side, they have the equal performance. But now in the bottom rows, I want to prove that how the financing side will make difference in their values. Okay, that's my intentional point. That's why my starting point is operating profit, which is coming only because of assets, no role of liability side, no role of financing. And I take the same amount as well so that we have a good comparison. Okay. The company which is L, Levered, has borrowed $1,000. And the rate of interest is 8% a year per annum. Needless to say, for you, this interest is zero because unlevered company doesn't borrow, but the levered company does borrow. And the levered company has borrowed $1,000 and it pays 8% rate of interest. So when you calculate 8% of 1,000, it comes to be 80. And then, uh, you know, from operating profit, when you minus finance cost, you get profit before tax or the income before tax or you call it gross profit or you call it pre-tax uh, pre income or you can call it reserves before tax. So thousand minus zero is thousand. So the gross profit is or the profit before tax or the earnings before tax or the income before tax is thousand minus zero is equal to thousand. Whereas in case of levered company, it's 1,000 minus 80, 920, 920. And then imagine that both companies are also paying the same percentage of tax, the corporate tax, 34%. Okay, so the corporate tax rate is 34%. 34% of 1,000 is 340. Whereas 34% on 920 is 312.80. And then when we subtract tax amount from the profit before tax, what we get is net income or net profit or profit after tax or earnings after tax or income after tax. So 1000 minus 340 is 660. So your final income final profit is 660 from 920, 312.80 minus, you get 607.20. Now, the next question, which is very crucial, that how much money, how much cash flow you are giving to your investors? Remember, investors are debt holders plus equity holders. Look at the lever, uh, look at the unlevered company. The unlevered company gives zero to its debt holders because there's no debt. All the money it, it gives to its shareholders, 660. So zero plus 660 is 660 here. On the other hand, if you look at the levered company, the levered company is giving $80 to its uh, debt holders because there was a thousand dollars debt at 8%. And 
and then it gives six or seven point twenty dollars to its equity holders. So how much cash flow it generates for its investors? That is eighty for debt holders and six or seven point twenty for equity holders. All together, it is generating six eight seven point twenty. It means that the company, this company, is giving six sixty to its investors. This company is giving six eighty seven point twenty to its investors. So that unlevered company is able to produce twenty seven point twenty dollars worth more value to its investors. And this additional increase in the value of the company is purely because of financing. Why it's purely because of financing? Because this difference is made by taxation. If there was no tax, imagine in this example, I assume no tax, then this will be zero, this will be zero, this will be thousand, thousand, this will be 80 plus 920, thousand, no difference. But now this difference is made. And this difference, if, if you see 27.20 where it comes from, this is 34% of interest. So whatever interest you pay, multiply it with the tax rate, 34%, that difference you can find out here. So this is the, we call it interest tax shield. This is the value the company has created through the financing. And this value is only available to the levered company. Levered means the one who has borrowed. Okay, and this assumption, this calculation is also possible because we give up the, the very, very, very uh, unrealistic assumption of Modigliani and Miller, who say that in the, they talk about the perfectly perfect financial world. In the perfect financial world, the perfect financial world is a taxless world. Because in the, in the perfect world, there should not be any artificial restriction. Tax is an artificial restriction. Tax is some kind of artificial phenomena. It's not something organic. It's not coming from some, uh, with the, with the, with the, it's not divine. So this 27.20 is the additional value only available to the levered company, which has debt, because tax gives a uh, discrimination. Tax treats tax treats debt more preferentially than the equity holders, than the equity capital, and that's why, because of this preference of tax man, this 27.20 additional value is only available to the levered company or the one which has debt. Hence, we prove uh, Modigliani and Miller wrong uh, with the assumption, with the, with the actual, with the reality that tax is a real phenomenon. If I take tax away from this calculation, then Modigliani and Miller are, are right. They're right. What if you think, what if you think uh, state uh, as a shareholder, uh, stockholder as well, so that the tax would be a good thing? So tax wouldn't be just a um, interest cost in a way, or a co just a cost, but it, it would be uh, equity in a way. Do you get my point? Like you pay for the state and you get something back later, you know? Yeah. Uh, this, this point is very interesting, Santu, you have raised. Um, let's not be, okay, I'm, I'm asking you to, I, I'm not saying that you become immoral, <laughs> but what I'm asking you is think from non-moralistic point of view, non-moralistic point of view. If I have a choice to pay, I would pay to my investor, but not to the state. Because when I pay something to my investor, I earn the fidelity, the loyalty, the, the good image of my company. So I basically, I pay and I, I know that this guy, I know he's my investor, I pay him. But when I pay a tax, 
there's no guarantee that I would be proportionately uh, beneficiary of my tax. So when you pay, when you pay tax, are you sure that the the tax which you have paid has returned to you exactly proportionately? No, so of course a, not. Of course not. So there is a there is a problem of reciprocity. We can't measure. Maybe I, for example, I can say that hey, I pay tax hundred euros and I can benefit from the state one hundred and fifty. But still, there is a there is a measurement issue. There is a problem of calculation of that. How can I say that I'm I'm a beneficiary proportionately of the tax which I pay? It's difficult to identify. But when you pay it to your investors, you are you are basically getting their fidelity or their loyalty proportionately. There is a very direct transaction. Do you get the point? Yeah, so, yeah, so, I do, I do. So, so that, that, that makes some somewhat, uh, even though tax is very important tax, the state is a big, st uh, st the state is a state stakeholder of the company and the state needs to be, uh, to get tax revenue. That's very crucial, I'm not denying it. But if I think from very, non, not immoralistic, but non-moralistic perspective, uh, then the companies would rather give this money to their investors than to the tax man. Yeah, yeah, but it was just to think like, because the, how do you say, it, a dark economy, you know, that the yeah. people are avoiding taxes and so on, and it can be uh, bad for the companies as well, you know? Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Totally but now you can see that uh, that this this difference this is the value creation this is the value addition so financing uh, unlike Modigliani and Miller who say that the value driver is only the asset side that is the performance from assets measured by EBIT uh, we prove that the value can be created from the financing side as well which is available to the levered company via taxation. Okay, that's enough for today.